You're listening to Paul Anderson. This is the Sideshow Podcast. I am your host, Paul Anderson, and this is the Sideshow PC. This week I am going to be joined by the guitarist of the band, Forever Came Calling. Forever Came Calling, I learned about um, actually through a documentary that the Warped, the Vance Warp Tour ended up shooting. It was called No Rooms for Rock Stars. You can definitely look it up and check it out. Um, but um, we're going to be joined by one of their newer members, uh Tom Lovejoy, and you know, I can be more stoked to talk to a dude um, and learn a little bit more about him as a guitar player and being a member of Forever Came Calling, a um, California pop punk band. So I'm gonna give him a call right now, um, and we're gonna um, we're gonna have ourselves a conversation and see what is up with him. So let's do this. Just give me one moment. Gonna see what's up with Tom here. Hello. Hello. What is up, dude? Not much, dude. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Hey, thanks for doing my show. Yeah, no problem, man. Um, so yeah, we're recording already. So I just figured I'd let you know. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about um forever came calling i mean shit i mean you are you're one of their newer members now if i'm correct right uh wish uh can you still hear me by the way yeah i can hear you dude okay cool yeah uh i'm one of the i guess the newer guys i joined um i joined in 2014 right what uh right when what matters most came out mm -hmm. um but i've known all uh i met john and joe when I was in a band called Latin for Truth and we toured together in like I don't know, I don't know, that was probably like two thousand uh probably two thousand eleven or two thousand twelve. I don't really remember it was, it was before uh they had even put out like anything on Pure Noise or a full length record or anything. But um oh. but yeah, um we're like I don't know, we're just a pop punk band from uh the rest of the guys are from twenty nine palms, California. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Oh wow! Um, yeah, it's kind of a nightmare, but uh, uh, yeah, we, I don't. Know, we ever since I've been in the band, we've just been touring real hard, grinding real hard. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a couple of records on uh, Pure Noise Records that people might have checked out. One called Contender, uh, what and one called What Matters Most. Mm -hmm. We're doing a new, we're about to start recording a new record pretty soon. Oh, no kidding! That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'm re we're all really excited about that. Now, um. Being now being one of the newer members, is it um, been? Actually, let's. Let, I want to back it up a little bit. Uh, I know. Um, I'm just cool. curious now to learn a little bit about uh, learn about you, like from the past. Um, now you said you were in a band called Latin for Truth. Yeah, yeah. And any of these other bands now? Are, were they pop punk bands or were they more or less like? I mean, I know sometimes I've talked to other people where they've been in completely 360 like. Um, situation musically like but it's a great challenge now any of your past um your past projects what were those like yeah um so so latin for truth was uh was a pop punk band uh the funny the funny story of that band that that's another band i joined after they had been like established and mm -hmm. they were one of the earlier bands in that easy core and the whole easy core movement thing yeah um i if you search like I half the half the videos you search with like top pop punk breakdowns or whatever, there's one or two Latin for Truth songs in them. And uh, when FCC did a tour with uh, Chunk No Cap and Chunk, uh, we were talking uh, one day, and I realized when I was in Latin for Truth, we had actually met in a gas station like somewhere in the Midwest, and uh, then we had talked about they they told me about how Latin for Truth was like 
uh, like an influential band on them because they were like, we, I don't know, that was just one of like the, I guess not the first bands to do that style of music. They were one of the earlier ones that didn't get a lot of recognition. Yeah. And after I, after I joined the band, it went to more of like, you know, like catchy pop punk music. And by the, the end of that band, that band is one of the bands that did a 360 where it turns the tail and it just sounded like this ungodly concoction of like, metal and mastodon and between the barrier to me would still like trying to sing poppy melodies over it and it was definitely really interesting i loved it but a lot of people we lost a lot of uh a lot of our fan base over that excuse me yeah um for making such a, a drastic change and i totally get why yeah but as far as yeah as far as other bands i've um i was in a band for a long time for like almost 10 years called word travels fast it was like Started out as a pretty uh, run of the mill pop punk band, and by the end of it, it was a uh, it was like this mix of everything I loved about music. One of one of my favorite bands is the Dillinger Escape Plan, and the whole point of uh, the last couple of Word Travels Fast records that I did were just trying to mix like my love for like uh, pop punk music and like really catchy melodies and everything with uh, like the intensity of that band and like mm-hmm. uh, some of the technicality of that band. I agree. Yeah, um, no, dude. And but besides that, um, I've been in a lot of like metal bands and a lot of hard- hardcore bands um, my whole life. Um, right now, I'm in a, a metal band or like a metalcore band called Vatican. That's a uh, we're about to put out a new record, and it's um kind of a mix between like some of like the '90s metalcore throwback that some people are trying to do right now, and mm. um, some of like the newer like there's some like newer metal influences like stuff like Gojira. And uh, more Mastodon and things like that, and that's uh, that's like my second love right now. Is I, I love I love like I love nothing more than playing just a really hard, really hard ass breakdown. Oh, that's so, awesome. uh, so yeah, I, I mean I've kind of run the gambit as far as everything you can do in like aggressive music. I'm I've been in like rock like just straightforward rock bands. I'm I'm in another band right now that's uh kind of in. I can't like talk about it a ton, but it's in like, it's like a rock band that's kind of in like a bit of a development hell situation mm-hmm. with a label where you know I, I kind of signed on to like this weird development deal and we like we did some work with some writers and things like that. We have a, a record and sitting and we're just trying to see who's going to put it out and what's going to happen. But I've tried to challenge myself as much as I can to uh, see if I can take what I like about songwriting and apply it to as many genres as possible. That's awesome. I mean. I'm I'm from Mass. Uh, I'm Massachusetts, and um, I know our area ha- is very heavily influenced with the hardcore scene and the metalcore oh, yeah. scene. I mean, y- you know, I mean, that's the mm-hmm. one thing Boston kind of had going has going for it with um, yeah the luck of music is like you know we have bands like uh, Barrier Dead and uh, Vanna and all those boys. So yeah, the Acacia Strain, of course. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the Boston scene was like when I first got into hardcore was obviously like a very like influential thing on me and uh the first time that i got to play like the palladium in mm-hmm. uh in worcester with forever came calling was like a big deal because i had seen it like one of the first things that got me into this music was like the new england metalcore and hardcore fest dvds oh yeah and seeing like you know seeing i'm trying to remember who all was on that but like unearth and shah Halud and um i don't remember if terror was on that one but like uh blood has been shed like the, like those bands um were like huge on me and then all the stuff that came from just the northeast in general around that time like that was when the big like metalcore movement popped off and bands like Killswitch and Gage were huge and that was a that was a big thing for me when I was younger but Barrier Dead was another one I went back and tried and listened to cover your tracks the other day and I forgot that some of it is still really really hard oh yeah dude I mean if you I mean if you like Barrier Dead I mean Mosh and Roll I mean that was their um, first album back with uh, Matt Brusso and that's... yeah I, I just heard that and it's pretty cool I need I need to like try to really dive into it oh it's awesome man it's one of my uh, one of my favorite records for sure uh, I'm a huge Barrier Dead fan being from here so <laughs> um, cool. dude that's awesome that you're you know you definitely have a nice mix so um, being in a pop punk band and being in all these other bands now what what do you prefer i mean not necessarily prefer but what do you find more challenging i guess um when it comes down to being a guitar player uh that's kind of a good way to look at it i mean pop punk music and um hardcore music all they're they're very night and day um i mean i guess the challenge it, it depends on like the genre the challenging thing for me in like hardcore is that I, I lo- one of the things i love about pop music and pop punk is like 
having like memorable songs and like song structure. So trying to bring that into hardcore with like a lot of stuff with hardcore bands and metalcore bands, you can kind of just do riff one, riff two, riff three, riff four. And the song doesn't really need to have like a chorus or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But so I, I try really hard to like still have memorable hooks Nice. In uh, in songs of those bands, even if it's not like a vocal hook, but like a guitar hook. But as far as like the challenges of pop punk music, that's kind of a, a different gambit for me because uh, I lo- I love to shred. Mm-hmm. Like I like when Forever Came Calling plays, I try to play just what's on the records. But also, I have like no problem just making things up as I go and like pl- just playing stuff that's in key and just kind of having fun with it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, and I definitely have to. Um, not so much in like like when I was in Word Travels Fast, that band was just shred twenty four seven, and Latin for Truth is kind of the same way. But uh, with Forever Came Calling, it's just not appropriate for me to be playing like blazing fast riffs the entire time or pretending that every song is a guitar solo. Mm-hmm. Like not like not every song needs me to fuck to like tap all over it or like try to fake sweeps all over it. Yeah. Um. So that's the part for me is actually just like reeling myself in. And knowing that, like, the important part of the song is really just, like, if the chord progression's good and as long as the vocal's good, that's what really matters in that world of music. So sometimes it's just telling myself, like, hey, that riff's cool, mm-hmm. but maybe it doesn't need to be there. Or, hey, that riff, that lead is awesome, but it doesn't really need to be in the song. Um, so when we're writing music, uh, there's been some times where I've, or Joe, like, Joe or John have been like, hey, maybe that's too much, or even when I'm just writing alone, I'll spend like four hours demoing out this really complicated, crazy part. And then I'll just never show it to anyone because I know it's just not that kind of a thing. Like mm-hmm. I just bought, or I didn't buy, we're sponsored by this company called a uh, eight string, or excuse me. We're sponsored by this company called dream studio guitars. Okay. And, uh, they're, they're incredible to us. But one of the things that they are letting me use on the new record is a, uh, an eight string guitar that they just made. They've, it's just a prototype. They've only made a couple and the musician part of me is really excited about having that and doing things with it. And Joe asked me, why are you getting this guitar? Is it for like, is it just for a laugh? I was like, no, I can think of ways to practically use this on a record. And, uh, from like just overdub stuff to like really crazy riffs. But that's like a new challenge for me is to try to figure out how can I use this guitar in forever Kim calling songs? And is it too much? Cause it's just a mammoth, ridiculous instrument to have. Oh, I bet. Yeah. I love it, dude. That's fucking awesome. Um, Thanks. Now, um, pretty much. I mean, we'll back it up even a little more. Um, how long? I mean, how long have you been playing music? I mean, what's one of your earliest memories? I guess performing. Um, I've been. I started playing piano when I was, I want to say, in like the fifth grade, probably. Okay. And the first time I ever played music in front of people was doing piano recitals. Um, I, I kind of fell off on that. And, start, and started playing bass guitar. And then, um, but I, I didn't really start actively playing in like bands until I was uh, like 17. Uh, the first band that I ever played a show in was called Alua. It was like a sludge metal, kind of like a sludge metal band, kind of a mix of like sludge and crust punk. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that was like the first band I was in. At the same time, I was in a pop punk band called Reminisce. And, uh, which sounded kind of similar to, I guess, it was like kind of sound the same as Forever Came Calling does, mm-hmm. but just awful because I didn't understand how to write music. Um, but those were around when I was like 16, and that's when I really started diving into to playing music. But I guess I, I felt like I the first real memories I have of it were my parents would take me to see uh, concerts for random bands that they liked. Like my dad was really into this band called the Swing and Medallions that, kind of played the college circuit when he was younger okay. and uh when i was a little kid uh a couple of the guys that were in the swinging medallions got all their their sons to kind of start the band back over and my dad took me to see them and it was like beach boys like big band stuff but with like beach boys vocal harmonies and everything oh okay and that that's probably the first real vivid memory i have of seeing like live music and stuff um but other than that uh, yeah, it was just piano and then bass. And then when I was probably like, I played bass first, and then a year later I picked up a guitar. I've primarily played guitar ever since. You love it that much. Yeah, I mean, I love guitar. It's, it is truly like my life's blood. Um, 
I can't I can't I can't imagine a day not playing it. Now I'm not a guitar player personally, but I know um a lot of people I mean, you, what's your preferred setup, may I ask? Um, because I've been in so many heavy bands, I normally play uh some kind of some kind of pointy metal looking guitar with um like EMG or Seymour Duncan active pickups in them. Yep. So like kind of just the standard metal setup. Uh normally through like uh P V fifty one fifty or a Mesa uh I have an amp called a Mesa Stiletto Ace. Mm-hmm. It's like um it's not a very metal amp, but you can get a lot of metal sound out of it. I use that for Forever Came Calling. Or like an orange uh rocker verb or an orange O R one hundred. Um the I normally bounce between one of those amps and then just I have my pedal setup changes all the time, but the one thing I always have is uh a lot of guitar players know this one, an Ibanez Tube Screamer. It's just the classic distortion pedal. Everybody's got one. Um, I set that the way every metal guitar player does, where you turn all the gain off, you turn the volume all the way up, and every everything else I have is just toys. That's you know, that's the only pedal I really need. But nice. I I probably use I use a very metal setup all the time, and sometimes for Forever Came Calling specifically, it is wildly inappropriate for me to be playing. <laughs> that many metal guitars but I, I look in my room and i see like a seven string guitar that's pointy and has active pickups in it an eight string guitar that it, it has eight fucking strings it's a metal guitar <laughs> uh and then a bunch of other pointy guitars with active pickups in them and like flying v's and all this stuff so i just don't i don't have like non-metal instruments they just don't exist in my world there so you go. that's just what i play that's awesome i like that um now Let's talk about the new record. Uh, if 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 you guys are if you're able to talk about the new record, um, yeah, I can talk about it a little bit. Okay, cool. Um, pretty much, yeah. I mean, how have you guys are you guys obviously started writing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I was gonna say now you guys started writing. Now Joe is the main songwriter, I imagine. Kind of, yeah, kind of. I would if I if I wanted to be honest about it. I would say it's probably 60-40 between me and him, depending on the song. Okay. Because how it's gone is I've written a lot of the music, but obviously Joe, Joe is like the singer, and he's the one guy. Like he kind of guides the songs to a degree. So a lot of it is just piling on riffs and seeing what Joe likes and trying to build songs off of those. Because if Joe's not inspired by a song, yeah, like inspired to write vocals for it the song will essentially never be done because the vocals are the most important part. But um, there's been some songs that I've, like, as far as music, I've written completely from scratch and some songs that he's, uh, he's had ideas and sent me ideas and then I've built a song around it. So I'm probably writing more of the music, but he is outside of like pointers here and there from me and John. Mm-hmm. He's writing it like, you know, 90% of like the lyrics and, uh, and vocal melodies and things like that. That's really his world. And I think he's, uh, I think he's one of the most talented people in our genre as far as uh, melodies and, and with his lyrics. I think he says he has a way with words that a lot of other bands, I think, uh, don't have. I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, now, going into the studio, uh, how many songs have you guys written, and how many do you hope to actually come out with by the end? Um, we've written... I'm not 100% sure how many we're planning on coming out with yet. We kind of, We're kind of just doing the thing where... We wrote a ton of music, and we're going to go in and try to record a ton of music, and we'll just see what happens from there. Mm-hmm. Um, we're kind of going in looser than you probably normally would, but we, we just ha- we're just we lucky to have enough time to do it. Um, but I would say that we've written – not, com- not every song is complete, but we've written probably close to 20 songs. Well, that's not bad. For, uh, for the record, and obviously we're not going to record all of those, and obviously not all of those are – great but there's even like you know like five or six full songs that we wrote that we just never even demoed because they you have to just get through some of the chaff Mm -hmm. to get to the good songs but um yeah so i would say we probably really fleshed out we probably wrote like 22 ish songs and really fleshed out like 15 okay maybe a few more there you go so that's not bad i mean going in there you guys are pretty well prepared as now Depending on who you're recording with, um, do you guys have an engineer and a uh, producer already lined up and ready to go? We do. We uh, we actually went through a lot of different options for it, but we're um, we'll be going in. 
uh, with this guy. His name's Rick King. Rick. He's he runs a studio called King Sound out in Paducah, Kentucky. I think I've heard of him. And yeah, he's he's got uh, newer is not the right word, but he's um he's he's just started to get out some projects that are like getting noticed in like this world of music. Uh-huh. He's done uh, hit the lights. Just released a new song that he did. So he's doing some music with them. He did some stuff with uh, Daisy Head and Northbound, and he's—I know he's got some other stuff in the pipeline that I just don't know if I can like talk about or not. I that's, see. That's that's his stuff, not mine. Okay. I but yeah, yeah, he—he's a. Uh, we're really excited about working with him because he's he's hungry to do something, um, and really just wants to get like get his stuff out there and it. His um, his style of recording is sounds. It seems really cool. We, we've never worked with him before, but all our conversations with him have been really exciting. He sees music in a really similar way to the rest of us. He uh, he seems to have a good. He has a good grasp on theory, which is exciting to me. Um, but he also understands that song. You need to come at songwriting from an emotional standpoint, and all the cool tricks don't matter if it's not driving the right emotion for the song across. Mm-hmm. And so he understands that from the songwriting end, but also his stuff sounds really good, and he knows all the cool production tricks he knows how to layer guitars right and how to like you know how to do some cool stuff with synths here and there to make certain parts pop and and just cool little effects and everything so i'm really excited to work with him um but yeah that, that's who we're going with and uh, we'll be going in to, to start pretty soon nice i like that um now one more follow-up question Excuse to me. being in the studio um pretty much it's um what do you find one of your biggest challenges um going into the studio um or do you have any challenges kind of going into the studio now compared to previous releases um so i i I guess i can only like speak for myself on this because i wasn't in the band when they were recorded other releases but yeah this one compared to other records that i've done i'll tell you the, the two things that are the biggest challenges are um, we, we wrote some of these songs together, mm-hmm. like in a room, but we also wrote some of these songs, you know, across the country by just recording demos, sending them back and forth, talking about them on the phone, and then re-recording parts, talking about them on the phone and through text and sending them back and forth. So there is like that element of, uh, like, not unprepared isn't the right word because i like i know that we're all we've all been grinding the songs and i'll feel very prepared yeah but just some of them like you know were were written on the computer they weren't written as a band so there's that element of is this gonna like work in a room but we have um a few we have you know about a week worth of time while we're in the studio to just grind out the songs in pre-production before we ever start recording them to really make sure that all the parts gel in real life not just on a computer so that that part's been a is definitely a challenge. And the other thing is, um, in the past, a lot of records that I've done with other producers, we've just gone in, not really changed any of the songs and just recorded them as they were at, like, as the band wrote them. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's definitely not going to be the way it is this time. And part of that is because we didn't write the songs in a room together. Um, the other part is like one of the reasons you pay a producer is to have a different perspective on your songs and hopefully he can help you change things to make them better. And I know that there's definitely some stuff that's on the demos of the songs that are going to change. Mm. And I, a character flaw that I have is becoming too attached to the things that I write too fast. Mm. What I should really be doing is just writing them, putting them on a demo, and then just letting it go. And being like, well, I did that, and if it changes, it's fine. But I'll get... I'll get too emotionally invested in the music I write and I'll get too egotistical about it and say, well, I'm the shit. My songs are great. Why would you change them? And so I'm, I've been trying very hard over this to uh, just let it go because I've been the primary songwriter in a lot of my bands up until the past year or so when I joined, like, or, or past two years when I joined Vatican and when I joined Forever Came Calling. Hmm. Um, and the, the songwriting duties are more evenly split throughout the band. So it's not my way or the highway anymore. Yeah, that's a tough one, yeah. And everyone has everyone has a say, and that's how it should be. So th- that's that's some, a challenge that I have is just like letting go of like the demos and letting go of like my cool riffs and stuff, and just being like, hey, like let's just get the song out there. Let's let's make this song the best song it can be. Whatever ha- whatever has to be added should get added. Whatever has to be taken away should get taken away. Nice. I think that's a I think that's a, a very big challenge. So 
Yeah, it's um, it's definitely been like a weird one to face. I've only, I've really only ever dealt with one other producer that did that. That where I had that challenge with was this guy Corey Gable. Um, some people might have might know he is. He's done stuff for like Major League and Born Without Bones, mm -hmm. um, and he did some earlier stuff for Microwave. Him and Travis Hill recorded some stuff for my band Word Travels Fast. Travis Hill, some people might also know him because he recorded, he's done the past couple of microwave records and he's a, a great guy and a great friend of mine. Um, so I knew him when we were going in to record, but I didn't know Corey very well. And they were, we had one song that we were going to track and it was essentially all built around this one riff. The song was this one riff in like different variations over the whole song. And Corey and Trav both just felt like this, that part is very cool and very catchy, but you can't just build a song on one riff. You need, like, this needs a, a different chorus. This needs this. It needs that. And in my mind, I was just like, you guys are wrong. It's my band. It's not your band. Mm. Uh, and it was a very big hurdle for me to jump to let them change the song and to help. Because they didn't just write the song for us. They said, you should try doing this. So I rewrote the whole song. But even though I rewrote the song, it was because they are the ones that told me to do it. I didn't feel attached to it and i felt angry about it yeah and i just i just should not have felt that way because the song is definitely better as a result um i i was just being an asshole straight up <laughs> no, so it, it, it happens and it, but it, it took it took me like a year of sitting with that song and knowing that it was better before i would ever admit to anyone that hey that song is better um now because i'll go back and i'll watch videos of us playing the original version and then i'll hear the actual recorded version but the original version is still awesome to me but the other i like the song now is better and it would not have gone over as well if we had just recorded the original version now with that so i try i've tried to inter i've tried to make that a lesson in my life and, like really learn from that experience now was that um producer that you worked with that challenged you on that part um were they probably one of the more difficult producers that you ever had to work with or were there tougher ones that you've experienced uh i mean yeah it difficult but not in like a like a like a bad way no no like of course not. we did we just because me again his name's Corey, and me and we get along great uh we actually his band that he was in for a little while you me and everyone we know oh no shit a, yeah he he was in the the last lo version of that band the last lineup yep and um when we toured together it was uh two of the other guys from that word travels fast band were filling in for uh forever came calling at the time so the three of us, or the four of us, would sit and talk about recording that song and the EP that came after it all the time, just saying like, "I can't believe it, that we made it that, that like it was that difficult. It didn't need to be that difficult, and and everything." So like, we're still great friends about it, but um, it was it was hard just because I wasn't that was, he was the first guy to ever do that. Um, that's because he was used to working that way, and I wasn't used to working that way um, because I just I'd never encountered like like a professional producer i'd always just been doing records with my friends in basements or if i was going to a professional guy he was just there to engineer the the record he wasn't there to to make comments on songwriting or to make comments on parts his whole job was to be like yeah it was a good take and now i'm gonna mix it and make it sound good but Corey's job was just different and i knew that from the outset but i just wasn't ready to accept it at the time mm -hmm. so i don't i definitely don't i don't put it on him no. we just we just disagreed and I wasn't looking at it from the right lens. So I don't think it was like, like so it was difficult, but just not in like a, a mean, shitty way. There you go. I know definitely not everything can be easy. So that's a good thing, yeah. especially going forward, especially now that you're with um, Forever Came Calling and the opportunities that can come forward. Um, it's not going to be, your, it's not your first. It's not going to definitely not be your last. So, you know. Yeah. Um. All right. So I want to actually talk to you. I mean, you're a fan of music. I'm a fan of music. Um. One of my biggest um, things is like talking about shows that you know you've attended and really enjoyed. Um, that you can think of. What's one of your What's one of your favorite shows that you ever actually got to um, attend as a fan? Oh man. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, I had to think about it for a second because there, there's on. I've, I've gone to so many shows. Oh, same. That yeah. have been like incredible, and I've. Uh, I, one of my favorite things as a musician is from touring is getting to see bands I like all the time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those stories just come from like, like I, I'm a total nerd when we tour with people, um, with, with a band that we like, I'll be the person stage diving every single night. Um, 
Like if it's like if we're with a good hardcore band, I'll mosh every single night. I don't care. Nice. Um, but if it's like shows I've just attended, the last time I got to see the Dillinger Escape Plan, the Dil- the Dillinger Escape Plan is my favorite band of all time. They are the most challenging thing I ever experienced as far as music, and they really opened my eyes to a lot of different stuff um, and a, a different way of like viewing creativity. Um, but so they're like. They're, they're the reason that I, I see the world the way I see the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and that band's breaking up this year. That sucks. And, I, and it, it really sucks, but I think that band's going out on top. They made an incredible record, and their whole thing is like, we're going to break up while it's not sad. Like, eventually we'll get too old to do this, and it'll just be sad. So let's break up while we're the kings of what we do. So I get that and respect it. But yeah. they did, like, one more full U.S. tour, and they're probably not going to do another one. So I don't think I'll be able to see them. But I saw them in Atlanta on that tour, and it was at a pretty shitty venue. It wasn't very fun. Uh, the next night, I went up to Knoxville, Tennessee, and saw them in a much smaller room, and it was incredible. They played all the hits. They played all like the deep cuts I wanted to see. Um, I remember this kid in one of those like big fake Tyrannosaurus costumes, yeah. uh, crowd surfing and stage diving the whole time. <laughs> um, I got to like, I got like, you know, got to like get the mic during my favorite parts of all my favorite songs. Uh, and that was just like, a that was like really great closure for me on that band because I was the day that that band announced their breakup. I got probably 15 texts and calls from friends uh, asking me if I, I was okay and stuff. And they didn't say why they were calling. So I just got flooded with all these messages and thought like my best friend had died or something. Cause that's how dire the messages made it seem, but it's just cause my favorite band was breaking up, but it, it did. It honestly hit me really hard. Oh yeah, dude. Um, I, I know that feeling. Cause like, like, no joke. Right now, I'm wearing three pieces of Dillinger Escape Plan merch. <laughs> I just thought about that. I'm wearing a, a windbreaker because it's raining, a hat, and I have an, an under. I have like a shirt, a Dillinger shirt on underneath this. I'm supposed to be getting some Dillinger sweatpants soon, so I'll have the whole outfit. But uh, <laughs> yeah. And then they come out with shoes. You next. That's next. Yeah. Oh god, that would be terrible. I would love it. I'll just spray paint. I'll buy a pair of slip-ons and spray paint their logo on them. That'll be enough. There you go. <laughs> but I also just recently, another one of my favorite songwriters is Ben Folds. Um, who was like, do you know who Ben Folds is by any chance? I think I, I've heard his name around. I just he never was, really uh, sucked my teeth into him. That's cool. He was in like, he had a one hit in the 90s called Brick um, and a band called Ben Folds 5 that he was in. Okay, yeah. But he does solo stuff now and um, – he uh he just came to Atlanta and played a show with the Atlanta Symphony, mm. so where they were doing like you know, big orchestra interpretations of all of his songs, and that was incredible because I he's been doing that for years. I've never gotten a chance to see him do it, and that was like another like religious experience for me seeing him uh, seeing him do that and just he- and just hearing it in that room and sounded better than uh, any record I've ever heard in my life because the the acoustics in this in the Symphony Hall for Atlanta are incredible. And just hearing like these monumental versions of songs I've loved since I was a child, um, that was a really big thing for me. Um, the only other show I can think of that r- I like talk about all the time is the first time I saw Neurosis, who are like one of the pioneers of like the post metal thing. Neurosis. Uh, I've never heard of them. Ner- Shame they're, on me. Um, they they're not as like they're like a like if you're into that kind of music they're like an iconic band yeah but they're not like the most out there thing but the first time i got to see them was definitely like a religious experience for me because they're one of the bands where they have visuals that attach to every song the songs are really long and brooding they don't stop in between songs um it's very heavy and it's just it's like it's a real emotional ride mm-hmm. when you watch that band because it's not just like a it's not like a fun show you're going for kind of like a pressing emotional experience and uh, I got to see them with like all my best friends who all like also love that band. We all saw them at the same time, and it was just like this. It was a really powerful thing to see. Now, was there ever um, any like local bands that you kind of growing up in the scene that you were like, you know, they kind of looked out for me as a uh, musician and pretty much kind of I don't know led you the way led you into music. I mean, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh. Um. Definitely. The, the... The funny story about that is a lot of those bands, a lot of those guys that I looked up to when I was younger, I ended up like playing in bands with or like working with in some capacity in music. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really became peers with them later on. The uh, the first show I ever attended um, was 
I saw this band called Stranger by Day, who was like, um, they were kind of, I'm trying to think, a mix of like, a mix of uh, skate punk and like, really like sad, like fast emo, but with like some metal riffs on top of it. Hmm. Um, they played the first show I ever went to, and I fell in love with that band, bought uh, the record that they had just put out, bought all their earlier records, and I loved that band up until they broke up like three years later. And when they broke up, it was that was a, another kind of crushing thing for me because they were the, the first thing I ever really attached to. And um, years later, their drummer, Ben Cato, started playing drums in that Word Travels Fast band I was in. Oh, no kidding. Uh, cool. And that, that was a really wild thing. The first time we, we jammed together uh, for that band, I was like, Ben, uh, this is like I, I, like, I had nerded out to him about it before, but so I'm like, this is crazy, man. Because, you know, you were obviously like, you were like one of the reasons I started diving into music, and the fact that we're even jamming together is crazy. And and then he and I just like, as far as shredding music, just linked in perfectly, and we just it, it, every time we practiced, it was just he's the most stoked person I've ever been around. He just loved to be playing fast shredding music, mm. and any crazy thing I could throw at him, he could throw something equally as crazy, if not crazier, back at me. So they're one of those bands. Um, another band was called We Were Only Fiction. They were like um, an emo band. That, I guess you could say they they sounded kind of like a mix of some of the stuff you would have heard on like, uh, I don't know, Drive Through is not the right word. They I kind of like a mix between the take like Taking Back Sunday and stuff in the scene like that. And oh, like old Jimmy school World. victory. Yeah, you old so yeah, victory. it definitely sound like some old school victory stuff for sure. And um, Years, like I became really close friends with them. Um, uh, they're one of their, their singer and guitar player, Travis Hill. He was mm-hmm. one of those producers I was talking about earlier. Yep. I ended up working with him, and uh, he became like a great friend of mine. His brother, Ty Hill, uh, plays bass in Microwave, and we're still really good friends. And we, like, our bands have played tons of shows together and stuff. So it's uh, most that's what's cool about, I guess, the scene that I grew up in is all the bands were like none of them ever really like, really like popped off and blew up yeah so they were big in the area but they weren't like these unreachable things so i just like the guys like some of the guys that i ended up idolizing when i was younger just became my friends later on um and i was like i that's a really cool experience i got to have that i feel like a lot of people kind of miss out on now because lots of dude like dudes and girls and people just like like they start a band they record a couple of records. If it doesn't pop off, it just ends. Yeah. Uh, and they just break up. But a lot of uh, the people I grew up with, you know, they grinded at, at being like local and regional touring bands for a really, really, really long time. Um, and so that instilled like a lot of work ethic in me. But just, you know, you just don't have like these bands just pop, come up around for a little bit and just break up so fast. They don't have time for like local kids to like really fall in love with them or like idolize them or anything just because. Uh, it's just that's not the way that music works now. You kind of have two full links to prove if you're going to matter in the world, and if they don't work, then it, bands just break up. It's just over. Yeah. People don't think that you're worth your, their time anymore. And I think there's very few bands that honestly um, bounce back from that sophomore slump. And that, yeah. I, I agree. No. I mean, I, what I like about this conversation that we're having is that, like, I love learning about other scenes. I mean, being from Mass, I mean, like I said earlier, um, you know, I have, I mean, this area has such a rich um, scene locally and, I mean, even just big-wise. I mean, like, you have, like, for us, we have um, Vanna, A Lost for Words. We had Therefore I Am, bands like mm-hmm. that. So it was like, you know, learning about the Atlanta scene is definitely uh, an eye-opener for me because, I mean, I love learning about it. You don't, up here, you don't yeah. you don't hear about it. And, and unless, like, I think the only band that truly ever kind of jumped out to me from the Atlanta area was um, I wrestled the bear once. Are they from Atlanta or are they from like Savannah? Are I they... can never remember. Savannah. I, or are they from, I don't know. Actually, you know what? Maybe, I, I'm, maybe I'm miss fucking speaking then. Um, I know I they're from I, the area. I can't, I seriously can't remember because they were like that band. If they are, if they were from here, they were never really on my radar until after they like blew, up. blew up and became like a, a real touring thing. But I mean, yeah, we haven't had that many bands that have really popped off from here in a long time like there, there's like massive bands like mastodon is a massive band oh for they're sure they're from the area and they're all like they're still really tied to like the atlanta culture which is cool but um foundation the hardcore band um they're from here and the, and they got 
especially for hardcore, they became a giant band for a long time. Um, and but other than that, the only band that's really mattered mattered in the big scheme of things, at least from this area recently, is Microwave. Microwave. Um, and I don't know if you've ever checked that band out, but they're awesome. They're on Sidewind Dummy. Have a couple of records out. Doing Warp Tour this year, so if you go to Warp Tour, you should definitely check them out because um, they're an incredible band. But oh, I'll be at Warp Tour. Are you going this yeah, year? Yeah, just. Am I going this year? Yeah. As long as I'm home, as long as I'm home, or I can go to a like, if I'm nearby a date when it's happening, I'm gonna go. Um, just with, we'll be, just with us recording, and mm. then with Vatic, my other band Vatican, we'll be touring some until Forever Came Calling starts touring again. So it just depends on my schedule. But I would love to go because I, I like seeing new bands. Uh, I see all my friends at Warp Tour, all my friends from the area, my friends that tour all the time. Yeah. I got a lot of friends that just do crew stuff now that just like do merch or tech for bands. I only get to see them when they come through every once in a while. So I really like Warp Tour for that because I get to see like a lot of my friends in one big swoop. Oh, for sure. I mean, you guys are, are you guys still, are you guys being managed by John Ryan? Or is, uh, yeah, we are. I was gonna say I read that somewhere. Uh, I read that online that you guys are being managed by him. And that's awesome. Yeah. I love John. He's such a good dude. I remember yeah, good guy. I met him uh, through Maddie Arsenal from A Loss of Words. So and he cool. was such a cool dude. Um, yeah, John's one of like the first guys I met in uh, like in touring bands that like always remembered me. I met him outside of um, I get I think it was like a Wonder Years and We Are the Union. We are the Union. I don't. Dude. I don't Love them. I don't remember if they were on that tour or not, but I, I love that band. I love We, we Are the Union, dude. We Are the Union used to come up here and play uh, up in Mass all the time because obviously mm-hmm. all the friend, all their friends were up here, and we had uh, yeah. we had a church out in Alston, Mass, um, that used to host shows, and they used to play up there. So what what church was that? The ICC. Okay, that was like a thing where I always wanted to go there. Burn and then, down. Yeah, I know, and then I was, I had. Latin for Truth was going to go up there I, I think play a show in like the basement there or something mm. and I found out, yeah no show at the ICC it's, it's literally gone I, oh. you know what sucks about that though too is like they ha- they had some of like the like they closed out I'm pretty sure they had uh, Have Hearts last show there which uh, that no that was in a, a different a different room was that it? Was Have Heart, well Have Heart played a lot of shows there mm-hmm. but Have Hearts uh, last show I can't remember what what the name of the the building's called but um it's not the icc it wasn't the there ICC? is a video that i i've been trying to find for like the past like two months mm-hmm. that um of them playing the icc right when their last full length came out and they're playing that song boston's and there's a pause uh where it's just vocals and everyone everyone in the room knows that part and all screens at the same time yeah and it's the loudest thing i've ever heard and I haven't seen the video in like four years. And I've been scouring YouTube trying to find it. I can't find it. It's really pissing me off. I'll make. A, I'll, I probably can message somebody that probably has it. So that would be sick. <laughs> but um, yeah, dude. Um, I love. I love how this conversation's going. Um, now one of the things I did a little. I did a little research, and you guys got to support Major League on one of their final shows. Am I correct in saying that? We actually. Um, we played, we we did both of their last tours together. We did a like, not a full U.S. tour, but basically an East Coast Midwest tour as yeah. their last tour. And then we went, the last shows were in Japan, and we played those shows too. Really, Japan? That's awesome. Yeah. Why Japan? Um. Well, you probably have to talk to uh, Brian from Major League a little bit about this for like the full story. But mm-hmm. basically, um. They they were ta- figuring out what they were gonna do. They were gonna do. They weren't even. We, we weren't sure if we were even go, going to tour together. Um, but we did uh, the the U.S. tour, and they were still trying to figure out doing a last show at home, mm-hmm. um, like a real like proper headliner. And then um, Mizuki, who runs Ice Girls Records out there, yeah, yeah, he, uh, he just uh, he wanted. He's like, he was a diehard supporter of major league for the longest time Mm -hmm. and like he's been a diehard supporter of this genre music for you know for longer than a lot of us have even given shit about it yeah um so he he offered to bring them over uh because he just wanted to see them a couple more times and major league always did really well out there and they needed a support band and we had been talking to mizuki off and on about coming out there 
um, our friends in season change were supposed to go. They weren't able to make it happen, so they asked uh-huh. us to go. Oh, wow. And we just said, yeah, we'll do it. And we had I, the guys in, ma- in Major League just um, – I think they were just satisfied with the shows we played in Japan and gave them, like, the closure they wanted. Because uh, the last show was legitimately, like, a, a real – like, a crazy show. It was one of the wildest reactions I've ever seen them have. And it was just, like, a – it was a really – incredible tour for all of us so maybe they just got the closure that they wanted out of it i don't i don't know for sure now had you had you been to um japan be- prior to that or no that was the first time i had gone um no no one in the band had gone before because it's mm. it's uh getting to, to japan to tour there is uh it's very expensive and it's a mu- i think it's a much bigger hurdle to jump than uh than going to like europe or the uk yeah so it's just, it's just hard to get over there but that was the first time i had gone and it it's my favorite tour I've ever done. It was short, but it was incredible. Excuse me. Um, yeah. Because it's like going to the. It's kind of like going to the future and the past at the same time. Mm. And it's also kind of like going to the moon because there's just things that you'll see there that we'll never see in America. You know. Hmm. Um, as far as like technology and also just with their culture, just because it's a much older place than America is. Oh, so it's it's sure. kind of like it's kind of like going to the UK and to England and to uh, Europe in that same respect, just because they've had more time to develop their culture there. And there's just more history there than there is here. You know, there's nothing here as far as like, you know, like your standard definition of Western culture, there's nothing here older than three or 400 years old. That's just how it is. But when you go to those places, there's years, upwards of thousands of years of history for you to like absorb. I like that. That's cool, dude. I always wanted to visit, um, I never actually dude. left the United States, unfortunately, not even to Canada. So, I really? definitely, yeah, it's a bucket list, dude. Um, definitely yeah. want to pick up and go sometime. Dude, I would highly recommend it. I got to travel a lot when I was a kid, and I was very lucky in that regard. And I think that's one of the reasons I enjoy touring so much, just because that was instilled in me when I was a kid. But uh, if you ever get to go to Japan, you got to go. Anyone that hears this, if they ever get a chance to go to Japan, they have to go because it's uh, it's definitely an eye an eye opening experience. Just seeing, just seeing the way their because their culture is just so much different than ours. Oh sure. Um, and it, it was just one. It just was the most fun I've ever had traveling, just with friends and just doing stuff I never got thought I would get a chance to do. Now, actually, you know, it's a good segue talking about um, be, traveling because the next um, topic I actually want to talk to you about was tour life. Um, what are some of the uh, what's some of the highlights that you like about touring? Um, and what are some of the things that you could honestly live without when it comes down to touring? Um, as far as things I can live without, uh, the, the thing that immediately comes to mind is the drives. Yeah. Um, we don't, you know, we don't tour in a bus. We don't tour in a bandwagon. We've been in a van or we have a, for a long time, we've had like a shuttle bus Mm. that we built bunks into. Um, so, you know, we do all the drives ourselves. And uh, in some places it's okay, but when you're like crossing the country from one coast to another, the drives are just long. Or when you're going up California, heading to uh, the Northwest, the drives are just insanely long. And sometimes you just run out of things to do. Or uh, I just I just sleep for as much as I possibly can when we're driving. And uh, I hate that aspect sometimes. Um, and also for me, because of where the band is. I have to fly all the time. I have to fly across the country or fly to this place, fly to that place. Oh, and I'm just, I'm, I'm very tired of being in airports. Uh, I'm very tired of standing in baggage check lines. I'm very tired of getting padded down because I forgot to take off my belt or something like that. Yeah. But um, other than that, that's pretty much my only real complaint about touring. That and sometimes you just have to eat garbage. <laughs> it's, it can, it's True. kind of, it's not impossible to eat healthy on tour, but it's very easy to eat trash every single day. Um, as far as what I love about touring, it's kind of everything else. I love me like meeting new people. Um, I have like, pe- I have like lifelong friends that I've met through touring from other bands and from people that I've just met at shows, mm-hmm. um, or people that I've gotten to stay with over like the 10 years I've toured. Um, I love pl- playing, playing shows is definitely my favorite thing in the world. It's the only place where I feel like I can do whatever I want judgment free for however much time I have. Absolutely. So I can just be as like wild as I want, or as funny as I want, or as angry as I want. Whatever I have to do to like get out, whatever I need to get out that day. So I love playing the shows. 
Um, I love I love eating new food. I love just going around and goofing off with my friends. I love off days, just seeing movies and trying to go to amusement parks and stuff. I love just getting into like the shady stuff you get into when you're doing like DIY, DIY level touring. Oh, for sure. And like just the the kind of like weird like like staying within the weird crusty like punk house because like forever came calling. Uh, we have like we live in like a, a good like we have like a good comfortable setting when we're touring. Mm-hmm. Um, we have plenty of places to stay and with like people that put us up in like awesome houses and everything. We'll get some hotels sometimes and it's it's cool, it's fun. Uh, Vatican, when I tour in that band right now, it's it's going back to like the DIY, the true grind of touring. And sometimes it's just like, how are we gonna afford this man? Like, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna do that? Or like, it's a hardcore band. And sometimes the venues in a shady area or shady things happen. And you're just like, is today the day that like, I have to like not whoop someone's ass in like an intimidating way. Is, the, <laughs> is today the day that like some bullshit has to go down. And, and, that's to, and part of that is, is, and that excites the shitty part of me. <laughs> um, Cause I used to have, I used to be kind of shitty when I was younger. And I was totally guys like, yeah, let's go hit mailboxes or like, I'm 16 and straight edge. I'll go to a party and like steal the guy that sells drugs. I'll steal his money. Like, when I was very, very young, that is the shit that I would do. Wow. And so every once in a while, like that that shitty part of me starts to creep up and I'm like, you know, you gotta like bring that down. That's real that's not cool. That's not- As someone who's in their twenties, that that is not funny by any means. Um but yeah, literally other than eating like trash and like some of the travel, I love every single aspect of touring. Um because every it, it just makes my day better every time. I, I never when I'm on tour, I just never think about. Besides when we're driving forever, I never think about all the problems I have. I like that, dude. Um, now, have you gotten the opportunity with uh, Forever Came Calling um, to play the Vans Warp Tour? I'm just trying to remember date wise. Um, last time you guys so played, we haven't done Warp Tour since 2013. We did 13. Um, in 2015. They did like a UK version of it. There was just like a big festival for one day. Oh yeah. And yeah. we did that. We did that. That was awesome. But that, that's just a different thing. That's, that's playing a big, a big one day festival that happens to be branded with the Vans warp tour thing. And that's yeah. just a whole different world. But the same year that they did it, that Forever came calling did warp tour. Mm-hmm. I was, I was also on the tour that year with a band called the sheds. Okay. I was playing for that band for a little while. Or I was literally just for that tour. And, um, so I got to, I guess you do that with them. That's when I started really, that was the first time I had seen some of the Forever Came Calling guys in a while. And that's when we first kind of started talking about me playing for the band again or playing for the band. Um, mm-hmm. But War Tour is awesome. Uh, next to Japan, it's my favorite tour I've ever done. Yep. It is kind of grueling, especially if you do it in a van because you're in hot parking lot, parking lots every single day with not really anywhere to go. It's funny. It's, you it's say... pretty, I'm yeah, sorry. it's pretty rare that it's next to anything cool, but um, it's awesome. You get taken care of really, really well. Um, you meet so many people. Mm. There's you'll always get into some. There's always some band that you literally thought you were going to hate. That by like the third time you've had to sit through their set, you find something you like about them, and then you end up hanging out with them at catering one day, and they're awesome. And then you like fall in love with the band. And uh, I think that part of it is so cool, just because you get. I don't think people realize how close the warp tour community can be oh, yeah. as far as like because it's the same people really running it every year um a lot of the same guys working on it uh, there's a few like legacy bands that have done it all the time and you, you just become very close to these people because you're in line for catering every single day you're seeing them at load in every day um and you, you just have to become close to them because you don't have an option there's nowhere else for you to go True. especially if you're in a van uh because you don't have ac anywhere so you're not going to go sit in your hot van <laughs> that would suck. I mean, yeah. it's funny because like I'm gonna I I was thinking about not bringing it up, but um, I I'm going to anyways. It was um, Forever Came Calling's um, participation in the uh, Warp Tour movie, um, No Room for Rock Stars. Yeah, and that's I think I I said in the beginning um in my intro I was that's how I learned about Forever Came Calling was through this yeah. movie and um you guys definitely I think. They definitely, uh, in general, um, hit the nail on the head. Where, as the as the young guns, as I'm going to say, um, have to go through the ups and downs and the struggles of getting that opportunity. And I think what I liked about the end of that was the fact that they actually got to play a set at some point in the show. Yeah, 
or in the movie. So it was like, you know, and there's no bullshit. That's what I liked about that movie is like, I imagine there was no bullshit like, you know, that was coming and mm-hmm. look where they're at now. I mean, look where you guys are at now as a band um, signed with Pure Noise and getting all these great opportunities. Um, I don't know. Now, did you have any participation in No Rooms for Rockstars? Just just want to. I, I didn't. The tour no. that I met them on was right after they had done all that. And uh, so, so I didn't like I. I, I miss a lot, like a lot of like the underdog period of the band that people talk about. Mm. I wasn't there for like I was grinding it out in my own bands doing my own thing. Yeah, um, doing the same stuff, but just not in this band. But when I met them, was right when they were No Room for Rockstars was getting ready to come out, mm. and uh, I do remember them all being like Joe and John and their drummer at the time Jeff, all being really excited, and they they viewed the world the same way I viewed the world at the same time. They're like wow, we're getting to tour. Um, our band is taking us places that we never thought we would go, which it still does. Mm -hmm. Um, they still, we still all view the world in the same way as we did in that, like that time when we had to grind everything DIY on our own. Um, it's still like any day we get to play a song is, um, like a real like blessing any day that we get to like, like every time we get to put out a record, it's a miracle. Um, the fact that kids show up to shows is incredible. Um, there's not like, there's not like we our band doesn't have jaded bullshit. There was a, there was definitely a period where I think we got kind of down on ourselves on some things, but we are I can guarantee you we are well beyond that point of like feeling down on ourselves about the band. Like all of us are nothing but excited about doing a new record and and getting back to like grinding it out because it's the thing that makes us the happiest. And that those like those kids that you see in that documentary. Mm-hmm. The people that are in, like, I can say from an outside perspective that Joe and that it's the same Joe and John, but just better versions of the same of Joe and John that are in the band now. They're still like the same great guys that are, have the same work ethic and the same drive. Now we can just be smarter about it. I like it, dude. That's a really good way to put it. Um, so I th- I'm pretty much out of questions, and I actually, ha- actually, no, I have one more question for you. And that's cool, whatever, man. Um, I'm gonna wrap up the show, but usually I like to leave. Um, I personally like to leave a, leave like the people who listen um, a taste of like what you guys, like you as a musician, um, kind of do. And in this situation, you you're in two bands, and I want to play a song from each band. Um, so I want to. I was gonna have you pick a Forever Came Calling song and one Vatican song, and I'll play them at the end of the episode so people can check them out. Cool. Okay. So if you want a Forever Came Calling song, I think my favorite one right now is a song called Substances. It's um, it's a really cool, fun song, but lyrically it deals with like some heavier. It deals with like. A friend of a friend of Joe and John's who I actually met when I was younger because he knows a lot of the people that live in Savannah and knows a lot of the guys in Vatican. He went through some problems and he ended up passing away shortly after the song was put out. But that's like a a really heavy song for all of us, yeah. and it, it's really fun to play. I, that that song really hits me hard. And then for uh, for Vatican, uh, play a song called uh, "Divine Ruination." It's a uh, it starts really really metal. Uh, there's a hard, it has like multiple hard ass breakdowns. One part that is literally just, I don't know if anyone listens to Cretopsy, the metal band, but there's a part that is literally just a Cretopsy riff that we just took and added two chugs. And that's the only difference, hmm. but there's that. And then it has this nice singing part. that's fun. I think that song's really cool. Um, and yeah, it's got hard breakdowns. I love hard <laughs> Like just stu- it's just stupid breakdowns, and that song feeds that part of me. All right, so all right, um, this is the sideshow PC. That was Tom Lovejoy, and uh, we're gonna be playing you "Forever Came Calling," "Substances," and Vatican's "Divine Ruination." Say it again. Is there it is. Ruin- That's the one. All right, we're gonna we're gonna play you that, guys, and uh, definitely don't forget to su- subscribe and uh, like the like the video or give me five if you got. Um, five stars in you throw it up on uh, YouTube Google Play help the show out alright until next week take care